to hodl or not to hodl which camp are you in we're not necessarily going to answer that question today but we are going to talk about it give the different sides of each opinion here and i'll try to keep my bias out of it if you've been watching for a while you know which camp i am in uh, but i will try to keep that opinion out of just going over what is good and uh the pros and cons of each and then we're also going to look a little bit at the bitcoin uh, having countdown and some daily charts really fast at the end of this video. So if you want to skip ahead to that, go ahead and look at the timestamps below and you can see where I look at the charts. So let's talk about to hodl or not to hodl. So first of all, you got two camps. You got the hodl camp and the non-hodl camp. Uh, so you got uh, companies like Marathon, Riot, Clean Spark, Bit Digital, Bit Farms, many others, Hut, uh, uh, that hold. The majority of the Bitcoin that they mine, then you've got companies like Iron, uh, Terra, I believe Terra Wool, I want to say, I might be misspeaking there, that tend to, uh, that, that they don't hold Bitcoin and they sell all the, the Bitcoin that they uh, mine. So first we're going to look at the HODL camp. Okay, so the, the pros of the HODL camp are the potential for the long-term growth, right? They're looking for that micro strategy sort of a, uh, a move here in terms of they're going to hold Bitcoin, it's going to go up in value and therefore make their companies more valuable. Now, this works in some ways because of the uh, accounting rules that have recently changed to allow Bitcoin uh, to reflect on the balance sheet, which makes them look more profitable than they actually are in terms of how much money they're actually retaining. Uh, but, I mean, Bitcoin is something of value, so technically they are retaining that and they have made this value. Okay. And then the next one is less taxable events. So they're paying less uh, not necessarily less tax but they are paying taxes less frequently than if they were to be selling their bitcoin all the time so less taxable events and potentially less incurred tax through all the small um sales throughout the year uh that add up to you know quarterly tax bills that may or, they may or may not be paying every quarter per, per, they probably are since they're businesses but if they're not of course that uh leads to additional fees for not paying it by the quarter so uh that's a fun thing about taxes <laughs> um so hodling can potentially minimize your taxes by minimizing the amount of taxable events of course you could look at that another way and say that you could end up paying more ta in taxes because you'd be selling at a higher price and therefore be paying more money overall in terms of dollar value for taxes uh, versus if you were selling all the time but eh. so the other thing is that it is a simpler strategy it is easy to just take a bitcoin hold it not do anything with it it's a lot easier than figuring out um you know mining it storing it for a short period of time moving it from cold wallets to hot wallets to exchanges to to making sales or or sending it to other wallets that are buying it outright from you uh, like blackrock has been doing with some of the miners um, making sure it goes to all the right accounts, making sure you keep track of all that accounting every single month, where it went, where it came from, where it went, how much it was, how much taxes you owe on it. That's a, there's a lot of overhead there in terms of just the labor involved with keeping track of it all. Uh, so it's a little simpler strategy. So with the, the downside of hodling is the missing out of potential profits. So if the price of Bitcoin goes down after you mine it, well, then you're just stuck underwater on that Bitcoin, which happens every four years or, or, you know, every you know, cycle when we start going into the crypto winter. Any Bitcoin being mined at the top of the market is going to be worth half or less than it was, uh, you know, at the time of mining six months from then. And that's just the name of the game. And that does cause issues in terms of some mining uh, outfits actually going bankrupt during that period of time. Um, some people are fearful that that could be happening right after the halving because of the loss of Bitcoin uh, production in terms of it being cut in half, um, which is why we're seeing some of the sell-off that we're seeing right now in miners all across the board. And it's been just as bad. Even today it was pretty bad. But we'll look at it. I mean, it wasn't the worst, but it wasn't great. You have limited liquidity when you are holding all the Bitcoin that you mine, because if that's your only, the only part of your business is mining Bitcoin and you don't sell any of your Bitcoin, well, then technically you're not actually making any money other than, you know, the network fees. But we're not going to talk about the network fees, but they have become a big part ever since ordinals became a thing. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. But basically, you have a limited amount of liquidity. If you're not able to generate revenue by uh, some other means, like in the case of Riot, they do their energy credits. But digital does AI, uh, an AI side business, a business as well as staking Ethereum. And then you got Iron that also does an AI side business. Um, you got Marathon looking at their slipstream where they are 
um, having people pay to move their Bitcoin transactions to the front of the line, uh, things like that in order to create more revenue. If you're not doing that and you're hodling, well, then you could, you're diluting your stock uh, basically in order to, to keep the lights on until you are, uh, until such a time that you're able to sell that Bitcoin or decide to sell that Bitcoin, uh, that or you're taking on debt. Uh, then you have the opportunity cost where your money is tied up in Bitcoin that you could be using for other investments like building out your business, which most of them do by issuing uh, stock dilution at this point anyways. So selling your mind Bitcoin, what are some of the benefits of that? Uh, you get to lock in profits right away. So if, if Bitcoin is a high price, you are, you are making that money right now. Uh, and I would like to see, and we'll see during like a crypto winter, if they were um, mining unprofitable Bitcoin, do they just sell it? Do they hold on to it until it's more profitable or is it uh, better to sell it? We'll see. I don't know. I can't, I didn't follow them that closely. Someone in the comments will have to tell me about how that's worked out for some of the other ones that, that do the selling every month. And if that has ever been the case where they're just selling it underwater or not, I didn't, I, I just thought of that and I didn't look it up <laughs> yet. Uh, but you have that, right? You lock in, you're locking in your profits right away. Um, Increased liquidity, so you have cash on hand. You you can have the opportunity to to dilute your stock less or not at all if you're making enough money off of your Bitcoin. So there's that. You have that. You're getting profits. You have liquidity for expanding your business and growing your hash rate and getting more competitive uh, versus some companies that are just issuing stock, hoping to to just dump it on their shareholders and and collect that revenue or not necessarily necessarily revenue, but collecting that that money and then deploying that in order to expand their business and just hoping that, that you know, their investors will accept that um, versus having that money to just do what they want with. Um, and some companies do both. And we'll talk about that in a little bit here as well. Then you also have the reduced risk. Uh, you avoid the risk of holding um, Bitcoin during the, the winter. Now, we can kind of predict when the winter is likely to happen. So it's probably not the most difficult thing to sell somewhere near a peak in the market, nor I mean, some of these miners, they sell enough of it, they might create a peak in the market. <laughs> but uh, you don't want to be holding it, you know, you, you, your risk is reduced in terms of holding in the asset while it falls. Uh, some of the costs, the cons are tax implications. Every single sale is a taxable event, you're paying all those taxes, you're keeping track of all those taxes, you're paying someone to do it, you're also paying someone to manage the the, the transaction of the Bitcoin when it is being transacted with to wherever it is going. Uh, so there is, it, it is a much more complicated network of, uh, of business network than just hodling. Uh, so you do miss out on potential growth as well. Any Bitcoin you're selling right now, if Bitcoin becomes more valuable in the future, you miss out on that potential growth. Um, so that is also an issue. So if Bitcoin goes to a million dollars six months from now, and you're selling it at $60,000 right now, well, you're going to be kicking yourself pretty hard, I imagine, uh, because you could have had so much more money. Um, but of course, that is a risk we take with everything that is an investment or anything that we ever sell. So that's the same in all assets. Uh, market timing uh, can be difficult. So it's challenging to consistently predict price movements and sell at optimal times. Uh, so they might not be selling just every single day that they're mining Bitcoin. They could be waiting for a good time of the month or to sort of look at seasonality and decide, oh, is this a good time during this month? Or should we just front load selling so that we don't end up uh, in a bad month? Like some of the months are, are not great, like May, June, September, October. Those are just terrible months. Do you want to get the selling away out of the way as fast as possible or, or maybe even wait a short period of time before selling? Like you have to have a plan. Uh, which again comes with having employees, uh, creating strategies. It is just, it is more complicated in terms of like having that turnaround, having to make the sale consistently in that way. So let's see, let's look at the SWOT analysis for hodling. Uh, so we're going to look at strengths and weaknesses of both and then a little conclusion about it. Okay, so we've got hodl strengths versus weaknesses. The strengths of the hodl is your price appreciation. If you're holding it and it goes up, you make money. Wonderful concept, right? Uh, potential to sell your entire bag at strategically or strategically offload uh, your treasury at highs. So you have the potential to sell your bag at highs. So let's say Bitcoin goes up to $300,000 next month. If you've been holding and you have a whole bunch of it, you can sell Bitcoin you mine for $10,000 for, you know, uh, however many hundreds of thousands of dollars it's worth now. And that is a massive, massive gain. Uh, so that's a pretty great strength, I think, in my mind. Uh, weaknesses, you have liquidity issues, which is why we have so much dilution in a lot of these stocks that have a big hold position or want to add to that hold position. They need to dilute us in order to expand their business. Uh, price drops. Uh, so a price drop can make your hold look really, really bad. Like, so in some of these earnings reports, especially during 
the winter when that comes back around this this bitcoin is going to be more of a liability on their balance sheet than an asset uh because it'll look like they lost a ton of money especially if bitcoin drops you know the the average 70 60 to 80 percent value that would be kind of more of a liability for their earnings reports during uh the winter at which point uh, you're going to see some pretty big sell-offs during those earnings reports at, at that time so that makes turns an asset into a liability at that point uh so the selling the strengths versus weaknesses of selling your Bitcoin, the strengths, you have cash flow for your business. You have money to spend on expanding your business without dilution, without debt, without, I mean, I'm sure they take debt, but you know, without needing as much debt or dilution on your stock. And that really gives you a lot of um, ability to, to, to be nimble with the things that you do and when you do them without having to go begging for money, basically. Uh, you have less risk to long-term price fluctuations. So, you, you know, it's the here and the now. If you're creating Bitcoin for less than a Bitcoin costs right now, well, then that's profit and you're making it. So uh, that is a strength. You you can capitalize on profit right now versus waiting and hoping that it doesn't, you know, collapse and and, and end up being, you know, a non-existent asset in a couple of years. And you're just here holding tens of thousands of just like this worthless thing. Uh, weaknesses. You miss out on selling a big bag at the top. You're not accumulating. You don't have a whole bunch to sell at one time. It's just whatever you are making, you are selling. So that's a bit of a weakness there. While you are capitalizing on profit right now, you're missing out on potential future profit. Okay, there's, there's you know, there's, there's give and take to everything. The other weakness is that you have more frequent taxable events and transaction costs. So there's a lot more cost and complexity in your operation when you're selling all the time, uh, which is what I've already mentioned as well. So those are the strengths and the weaknesses of totaling your bitcoin or not as a bitcoin miner uh personally i am in the hodl camp i do think i believe that bitcoin is going to be significantly more valuable in the future than it is right now and that holding it will result in positive results for the companies that i invest in that is my opinion uh if you do not share it that is fine um i would love to hear about the reasons why uh, you are not in that camp in the comments. Uh, let's keep it civil. Let's keep it safe. Let's keep it, you know, good and honest in the comments, please. That would be much appreciated. Um, but to choosing to hold or not to hold, it really just comes down to the company, what their goals are, what their risk tolerances, what their risk tolerances are, what their financial goals are. And just, I mean, honestly, even just a well diversified strategy, including selling and holding could be a good um, outlook for some of these companies. I know some and I've criticized them before, like BitDigital. Uh, they were selling a lot of their Bitcoin for a while there to establish their AI business, which at the time I was criticizing because I didn't like that they were doing that. Uh, oh, I didn't like how much they were selling. They were selling like 150% of their Bitcoin uh, mine per month sometimes, eating significantly into their total position, which I didn't necessarily like. I would have been a lot less... Um, against it if they were just selling what they had mined that month versus like eating into large chunks of their Bitcoin at the time. Now it worked out. So I got back into my position with digital because it worked out because I see that they're executing because I see that they are actually doing what they say they're going to do and it is working out well. And that's pretty great. And I'm happy with that now. Um, but I wasn't at the time. So perhaps there there, there is space for both, I think. Uh, and it really just comes down to what are your goals? What are your perspectives? And where do you see these things going? Now, I think honestly, if Bitcoin does a big rise up into the hundreds of thousands of dollars, it doesn't matter what your strategy is. If you're involved with Bitcoin, you're going up. You know, the, the a rising tide uh, rises all boats, right? Raises all boats sort of scenario. So I don't think it necessarily matters as much. I just, for me, I like the idea of the micro strategy um, the way that they are working with it, their their plan, their game plan, where they're just collecting as much as they can, and that's going to uh, balloon their balance sheet and just make them look excessively wealthy and make their stock just you know, go up big. That's what I. That's the kind of line that I'm on here with my thought uh, for some of the miners here. Now I might be wrong. I'm totally open to being wrong. I don't. I, I know I'm not right all the time, or even most of the time. <laughs> you know, some of the time is good enough for me. So, and I'm hoping that this is one of those times where that thought is correct and it doesn't come back to bite me. That's all.
Gold miners, we're going to talk a little bit about gold miners. Now, gold is a little bit different from Bitcoin, whereas gold is a physical exist, you know, physically existing asset that you have to put somewhere. I mean, Bitcoin, you technically have to put somewhere, but it all fits on a flash drive. So it, does, it kind of exists in this digital, digital space. So gold miners are, have a, a little bit more of an incentive to sell their gold than Bitcoin miners do. Uh, also, the other aspect of it is that gold miners don't necessarily make things with the gold. Like they generally don't have refineries. They're not the ones making the jewelry or the electronics, the consumer electronics that the gold goes into or, you know, anything of uh, any of the other products that gold goes into because gold is uh, definitely a, a hard commodity that we need for so many, many different reasons other than, you know, store value or money. So there is a greater incentive to sell gold than to sell Bitcoin. So it's not a pure comparison, but I just wanted to talk about it. So, uh, so in fact, most gold miners sell the gold that they extract versus holding on to it. Now, one of the reasons for that is that they need cash. So cash flow to run the business. That's a very equipment, capital, and labor intensive process extracting gold. Uh, then they have also limited expertise. They don't necessarily or usually refine the gold or set, create the part of the gold, you know, or make the gold into a thing that would be used in a final product. So they don't do the final product. They just get the hard resource, sell it to somebody that can refine it. They refine it, they melt it into bars, and then they sell it to someone else that makes gold pins for RAM or, you know, jewelry or just, you know, keeps it as bars and sells it to a government or, or a collector, you know, someone like that. Gold miners usually don't do that. They're just, they're out there in the dirt, getting the rocks, finding the gold, send it off to, to the refineries who buy it from them. Uh, then you have market uh, efficiency. The gold market is highly liquid, meaning there are many buyers and sellers. This allows miners to easily convert their gold into cash at the current market price. Now, that is the same with Bitcoin. That is very similar to Bitcoin. Uh, but, you know, it's easy to sell it. It's difficult to refine it. It's also difficult to store it. But we'll talk about this that as well here. Some small scale miners, they will hold their gold, uh, especially if it's like a really small operation or family run op operation or a hobbyist. Like it, it kind of has a little more sentimental value to it. It means something to them. Or maybe they're even artists and they're making things out of that gold. Who knows? In that aspect. So like small, small scale miners will generally keep it. Large scale miners, uh, they won't keep it because where are they going to put it? It's huge. Well, we'll talk about that in a minute. <laughs> a speculation on price. Sometimes gold miners will keep it on the speculation that gold is going to do a big sharp rise soon and they can sell it at a much higher price than it currently is, right? Bringing your product to market at the most opportune time, assuming they have somewhere to keep it until that time. Uh, then also storage options. Some refineries might offer storage services, allowing a miner to hold on to some of their gold in exchange for paying the refinery to hold it. Now, the thing with gold that is very different from Bitcoin is that it is massive. It takes up a lot of space. You need to put it somewhere. You need to construct a safe place to keep that gold. You need to hire people to watch over that gold, keep to maintain the, the space that it is in, you know, dust it off, put it, move it here and there, whatever. I don't know exactly what they do, but you also need to pay people to protect that gold. That is all excessively expensive. So holding on to gold, really not much of an incentive to hold on to it physically because one you have to you have to keep it safe right that's a big thing you have to store it somewhere and keep it safe if you don't have a lot of space right and it has to be stationary for the most part have you tried moving gold around it is heavy it is difficult to do it is very expensive to do way more expensive than paying a bitcoin transaction fee by the way <laughs> so gold is a very difficult thing to hold on to in mass quantities <laughs> which is why the vast majority of it is in big underground bunkers protected by governments who have, you know, uh, endlessly deep pockets. So that's a little bit of a different there, difference there between gold miners versus Bitcoin miners. I can hold all the Bitcoin in the world on a flash drive, uh, you know, wear it around my neck, lose it, lose it at, on a whim versus gold. Uh, you know, you, you, you need to have a warehouse and you need to have basically a military watching out over it. So there, there is incentive to sell it versus uh, Bitcoin. But that's the hodl versus non-hodl camp. Let's go ahead and have that discussion in the comments. Now, 